Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. We're going to get started in the Word this morning. I'm thankful. Y'all are looking at, at, at the grace of God right now. Not how I physically look, but how I'm just standing up here. <laughs> it ain't nothing but the grace of God. And God gives us grace for our assignments. The same grace that rests upon me rests upon you for whatever he's called you to do. I know he'll, he'll, he'll do it. We just have to be obedient to walk it out. Amen. Are we ready to make our confession? Let's go. I am ready to receive the uncompromised word of God. This word is for me to change me for the better. I made it through yesterday. I am an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror. If God be for me, who can be against me? Right now, I declare victory in the name of Jesus. Well, if you agree with that, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Amen. Today is Survivor Sunday at Antioch. Amen. We are placing an emphasis on breast cancer awareness and domestic violence awareness. One in eight women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. In 2024, an estimated 310,720 women and 2,800 men will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. But there is hope. And the hope is when it is caught in its earlier stages, that treatment is very successful. So I wanna encourage you, if you have not gotten your mammogram, women, get your mammogram. And today we have some women among us who have survived breast cancer. I want those people to stand. You come on, you overcame breast cancer. Stand on up, 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 stand on up. Yeah, look at these survivors. Y'all, we got a gift for you. We just want to honor you and celebrate you for your bravery, for your resilience, for your strength. You are our sheroes. We exalt, extol the Lord this morning for your greatness. Come on, let's celebrate these women. Amen. And we have one more. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all may be seated. Also, we are going to acknowledge domestic violence awareness. In the United States, nearly every one in two women and more than two in five men reported experiencing intimate partner violence at some point in their lifetime. Domestic violence continues to profoundly affect the lives of countless women across the United States, remaining a persistent and critical issue. But we thank God today that we have some women among us who survived domestic violence. Come on, stand up for you. If you survived domestic violence, come on. Yes! We got a gift for y'all too. Because we just want to acknowledge your bravery. Come on, we are so grateful for your bravery. We're grateful for your strength. Amen. And if, if we don't have enough, I promise you, we're going to get you. So make sure, Omega, Elder DeBoer, make sure we, we figure out who those women are. Because we, we were wanting you to register so that we could celebrate you. But you're getting celebrated anyway. So we make sure you got what you need. So come on, can we celebrate these people of God today? Amen. So here's the real deal, y'all. These people that we're honoring today, they're survivors of breast cancer. They're survivors of domestic violence. It happened to them, and they survived it, but they're not the only survivors present today. Come on, there's some people in here who survived life situations. There are some people in here who survived challenges. There are some people in here who survived job loss. There are some people in here who survived loss of loved ones, divorce, sickness, loneliness, many other hard things. So all the survivors say amen. amen. See, here it is. The fact is 
we all in life will face adversity. All of us. Jesus told us that in this world, we're going to have some tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer because he's overcome the world, and that means you can overcome your stuff too. These things are going to be part of our journey here on earth, but I want to encourage us today to be able to go through this journey with peace. I can choose how I'm going to respond. I can't choose what happens to me, but I can choose my response. And in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, we have a blueprint for a scripture on how to survive adversity. I'm going to um, read it to you from the uh, NIV version. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. This scripture epitomizes survival in adversity. Despite the challenges and difficulties we face, we are not defeated. I am not defeated. You are not defeated. Amen? Because our spirits remain unconquered. So cancer can't conquer my spirit. Job loss can't conquer my spirit. What's happening on the outside can't conquer my spirit because my spirit has been redeemed. Those of us who know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, our spirits have been redeemed from death. Our spirits have been regenerated to life, and we have eternal life. My goal today is to encourage you to walk through your adversity with hope and peace. I want to encourage you to prioritize faith, over feelings. See, what we just read right here, this is feelings. It says, I'm hard-pressed on every side. That's a feeling. How many of you have ever felt hard-pressed? That's a feeling. But then the faith says, but you're not crushed. Why are you not crushed? Because Jesus is on the inside of you. We say it every Sunday, if God be for me, who can be against me? Why do we say that? Because there is nothing on the outside can crush what's on the inside. I am already victorious, and so we have these feelings, and we, we don't know how to prioritize. See, some, when I was growing up in church, they would tell you, you're wrong for feeling that. I'm not wrong for what I feel, because what I feel is my feelings. But where the issue happens is when I allow my feelings to override my faith. So I can feel what I feel, but my faith has to be bigger than my feelings because I be in my feelings a lot. Anybody be in their feelings? Thank God he doesn't call us to walk by feelings. Amen? So I feel pressed, but I'm not crushed. I feel perplexed, but I'm not destroyed. I feel persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. I feel struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I can't live by feelings. So we find ourselves feeling discouraged. We find ourselves feeling like we want to give up as we're going through our adversity. And even though we're in these places and we have these experiences don't, that don't feel good, I have a good word for you from the Lord. Go to Psalm chapter 37. Because I want you to understand, God is not shocked by where you are, by what you're going through, by the challenges that you're facing. These things don't shock him. But what he said to us in January still reigns true right now in October, and we know. All things, breast cancer, all things, domestic violence, all things, job loss, all things, disappointment, all things, backstabbing, all things, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. All things are going to work together for good. He never said it would feel good. He never said you're going to think it's good. But he said I'm going to mix it up together because he's a master mixer. And he'll mix it all up together so that it will work for good. And so in Psalm chapter 37, I want us to read at verses 23 through 24. Very familiar passage of scripture. We say it a lot. Today we're going to spend time diving into it. Verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. He delights in the way of the ordering. Not just in your way, but in the way that he orders. And then verse 26, 
verse 24 says, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. There is a path that God lays out for us. And if we are going to be successful going through life with hope and peace, then we must follow the path. So that's your subtitle for today, following the path. Tell somebody following the path. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I have not gotten any sleep, so I really need my amens today. Amen. Y'all pull, pull on the anointing. Amen. I'm going to give you some foundational statements. Statement number one, our steps are ordered by the Lord to accomplish his will. That's the whole purpose of our steps being ordered because he can't delight in our ways if it is not his will. Amen. And so he directs our steps. And so what does it mean to order? Let's just look at that word. Order means to guide. It means to direct, to make reliable, to set, to fix. Also, it means like choreographed. I was speaking with one of our young teens this morning. She's a dancer extraordinaire, Naya Whitaker. And I said, tell me about what happens when they teach you choreography. I said, do they teach you choreography like you have a whole group and they work with some people? She said, yeah, they do. But the whole thing is they show it to us the way it should be. And once you learn it the way it should be, then you are now able to bring your own strengths out. But we, they don't want us to look like 10 different people. They want us to look like one person. See, when God orders our step, he's not going to order your step one way and my step another way. God is not going to order me and my husband in the same household. He's not going to order him one way and me another way. But the problem is we don't want it to be ordered according to his will. We want it to be ordered according to our will. So that's when we get in our own freestyle. The choreography is going on, but we want to freestyle. This ain't freestyle time. This is choreographed time. This is steps being ordered by God. My steps are ordered to accomplish his will. On Friday morning, we flew to Durham, I mean to Raleigh, North Carolina, and we're on the plane and we're sitting in the plane, and I could see this lady come on, and when she saw us, her face just lit up, and she was waving like this, and for the life of me, I could not remember who she was, but I knew she looked familiar, and so as it was, she sat right behind us, like I'm sitting right here, she's sitting right behind me, and she was just smiling and waving, and then when, we, when the plane landed, I just started talking to her, and I was like, so where are you going? And she was like, my son had an accident, so I had to fly from Dallas to Raleigh to um, get to drive him back because he had a bad accident, but he's okay. But I had to come here. And so I said, remind me how I know you. She said, from church. I said, ooh. I'm usually pretty good with, with faces. But what she said was, she said, when I saw y'all on the plane, I knew it was going to be okay. She said, the moment I saw you, she said, and then I felt like the Lord was telling me, get back to church. I said, that sounds like God. Because here we are on this plane of all the places she could have gone, of all the places we could have gone, of all the places she could have set, of all the places I could have set, it was intentional that God allowed me and pastors to sit in front of a member of our church who we ain't seen in a while. And so we got off of that plane, and I prayed with her. I said, let's pray. Let's believe God that everything is going to go well. And she said, you might not see me Sunday, but I promise you, you're going to see me. And I'm looking for her to come back through those doors because God ordered my steps. God ordered her steps so that she could get back in position. So y'all be thinking it's happenstance. It ain't happenstance. You didn't just happen upon them. God ordered your steps. And what we have to be spiritually in tune enough with is the will of God concerning us. Statement number two, we must follow his cadence. We must follow his cadence. See, in military time, in military, you receive an authoritative command, direction, or instruction, and they're called what? Orders. Part of military training 
is teaching soldiers how to remain in unison through a cadence. It is that cadence, that call and response chant that serves to keep everybody moving together. It's the drill sergeant or the unit leader. They lead them to maintain the pace and they maintain the morale because we can't be an effective unit if we are not flowing together. See, God has a cadence and it's up to us to find his cadence. God's beat may be our beat is, and we think just because we're making noise, we're in sync. We're not in sync. You double timing. God's single. But what we're doing is our own thing. But God says, if you want me to order your steps, I need you to. We're too individualized. I said this a couple of weeks ago, we want to do the seem right. God said, I ain't call you the seem right, I call you the right. And so what we must do is we got to trust, trust that cadence and, and flow with that. See, man says, show me and I'll trust you. God says, trust me and I'll show you. It's so interesting to me. You know, there are times where the Lord just sets us up and we don't even realize it. A few weeks ago, my husband said to me, he says, hey, come ride with me to Grapevine Mills Mall. What? We going to the mall? With your money? Okay. Like normally I got to ask him to go. He said, come ride with me to Grapevine Mills Mall. I need to go to the Nike store. Okay. How many of y'all been to the Nike store at Grapevine Mills Mall? It's the bomb. So he's like, I'm looking. I said, what you looking for? I don't know. I just feel led to go to Grapevine Mills Mall, Nike store. Well, let's roll. We go to the mall, and we in there, and I, I got stuff in my hand, y'all. He's still over there looking. I'm like, what? what's, going, what's going on? He said, I, ain't, I can't find anything. Well, I surely found some things, right? And in that moment, I'm standing over there trying to help him find because this was his excursion. So I'm like, I feel bad that I got stuff and he don't have stuff. So I'm just going through the rag. Do you like this? You like this? You like this? He's like, no, nah, I don't like that. I'm like, why, why did we come? Out the blue, somebody says, Pastor McGill. My husband turned around. It's a father of a college football player that we have not seen since high school. His son is at a D1 school and really going through. The coach is doing things like he going through. And so he said to my husband, he said, I need just somebody to talk to. So he started asking my husband, how did y'all this and how did y'all that and words of encouragement. So my husband just pouring into him. This man starts crying in the Nike store. He said, I needed to talk to you. Then his wife comes up and she's crying too because her husband has been so burdened because he didn't know how to help his son. So now the wife is rejoicing because her husband has gotten relief because somebody knew exactly what to say to speak into him because their steps were ordered. So y'all pastor caught the spirit because he ain't buy nothing, but I must have been missing in the spirit because I bought some. <laughs> pastor went in the minister. I went in the shop, somebody. Keep praying for me. I'm going to get myself together one of these days. <laughs> But you got to follow his cadence. Even if it don't make sense, follow his cadence. Even if there's no, un why are we in Nike at Grapevine Mills at this time on this day? There's a cadence. There was an orchestration of his steps, my husband's steps, in a department store so that ministry could take place so that a father could be encouraged. Follow the cadence. Statement number three, our steps will also include some stumbles. Scripture says, though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. 
though he stumbles, not if he stumbles, though he stumbles. So what that means is that there are times, y'all, we're going to find ourselves in situations where we got to grow through stuff. The stumble, it may have been my own pride. It may have been my own disobedience. It, may, it don't matter what it was. What matters is how you're going to respond because there's somebody there holding your hand so that you won't fall. And so what the problem is, we don't like to stumble because we think that means we're imperfect. Well, we are. That's why we need Jesus. We talked about David a few weeks ago, a man after God's own heart who stumbled. Peter has some stumbles. Paul has some stumbles. Stumbles is part of our human experience. The stumbles are not there to defeat us. They're there to build strength, perseverance, teach us more about ourselves, more about God. Can I just tell you, y'all, life be lifing. But lifing don't have to rob me of peace or joy or any of the fruit of the Spirit. What happens is we are looking at external things and trying to find our peace and trying to find our joy. But we can walk through life, what Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome it. So I want to give you three things to know as you follow the path. Three things to know as you follow the path. The first thing I want you to know is what God has for you is for you, and it's all good. Now, many times we use this past, we, we use this statement when it's something good. But I also want to tell you when it's hardships, it's for you. It's not just the good things. It's every day of my life, whatever I believe, if my steps are ordered, whatever it is that comes my way, it's for me. Go to Psalm 139. Because what we need to wrap our arms around is what God has for me. It is for me. And we, I'm telling you, we say that all the time. No man can take it, and they can't. But we can certainly abdicate it. We can certainly throw it away. In Psalm 139, verse 16, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. So what's happening is your life already existed before you came here. But when you came here, now God is putting you on the path in the book he already wrote about you. So God is not in heaven trying to figure out what he's going to do next. The move has already been set in motion. It's just you getting in position so that he can order your steps so that you can catch up with what he planned before your mama even knew your daddy. You saw me before I was born. Every day, every day, the good days, the bad days, the not so good days, the days I wanted to fight, the days I didn't want to get up, the days I wanted to give up, the days I wanted to give out. Every day of my life was recorded in this book. I don't think we understand that because we think God is shocked. I, I'm here to tell you he's not because he's sovereign. Every moment was laid out. Now, let me, let me caution you with one thing. Turn to John 21 because I, I want to caution you with something. We can be in certain seasons of our lives and we feel as though we're the only ones. Everybody else getting blessed. Everybody else got a husband. Everybody else got a car. Everybody else got a vacation plan. Everybody, blah, 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 blah. And we start to look at others as an indication of what God should be doing with us. And I'm here to tell you, when you compare yourself, comparison is the thief of joy. You were good with your car until you saw somebody else post a new car on social media. Now all of a sudden, what God bless you with, not good enough. You were good with your two-bedroom apartment because you had a one-bedroom apartment, and the Lord blessed you with a two-bedroom apartment. Then you messed around and saw somebody closed on a house. Lord, I'm faithful. I show up. I serve. They don't even serve. How they getting blessed? Lord, I tithe. I know I tithe. I look at them. They don't even pay attention when pastor talking about the offering, so I know they ain't tithing. 
How is it that they're getting blessed and I'm not? It's a dangerous place to be. John 21, Jesus began to tell Peter just how dangerous it was. In verse 20, chapter 21, John 21, verse 20, Peter turning around saw the disciple whom, John, whom Jesus loved following, who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seeing him said to, John, to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? He was like, see, Jesus had just told Peter what, had, what he had to do in previous scripture. He said, when you were younger, you could go and do what you wanted to do. But when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another will gird you. He's giving him something he didn't like. So Peter's response was, well, what about John? Like, what's going to happen to him? Because I'm going to feel better if I know something happened to him. Because that's really what it is. We want to feel better knowing somebody else going through something just like me. We are wrapped up in ourselves. And see, because we comparing, we can't find joy in our current state. Why isn't your bank account good enough? Why isn't your house good enough? Why isn't your car good enough? Why you have to dismiss what God has blessed you with because he blessed somebody else with something different? When you are faithful over a little, he'll make you ruler over much. So if you're not faithful serving in God's house, how are you going to go pastor a church? <laughs> I'm called to the nations, but you ain't served in this house. God does not promote unfaithfulness. God promotes faithfulness. When you are faithful over a little, I will make you ruler over much. I got to be faithful over my current house if I want promotion for a new house. I got to be faithful at my current job if I want promotion at a new job. You don't even show up on time now, but you want to be the CEO? Come on now. Like, can you just show up on time? But no, we don't want to do that. We want to find the easy path. You don't know how long that person been showing up. But remember, what God has for you is for you, and it's all good. Number two, the third thing I want you to, the uh, second thing I want you to know, there is strength in community. There is strength in community. Galatians 6, 2, in the NIV, NIV it says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So when I'm going through my situation, God has placed someone around me to help me carry the burden. If you've ever seen people that lift weights in a, in a, in a um, weight room, they have a lifter and a spotter. The spotter is not lifting the weight for the lifter, but the spotter is there in case the lifter need help. No one goes and lifts 500 pounds without a spotter. But here we are because we think we got our own business. I don't need nobody to help me. I got this. We are walking through life without having somebody to help us, somebody to pray for us, somebody to encourage us, somebody to come alongside of us, somebody to give you some money to get you some medicine, but you're too prideful to tell somebody that you need some. There's strength in community. See, when we go through hard times, the enemy wants us to be ashamed. He wants us to pull back, to pull away, to isolate. But that's not going to get us to where God wants us to be. 1 Corinthians 12, you should read that in your own time. It talks a lot about the eye being part of the body and the foot being part of the body. And all of those pieces are necessary. And one joint supplies the need of another. So I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers, but together we can make it work. That's how it works. I want you to go to Judges chapter 11. I want to talk to the women for, for, for a moment. Here is what I have learned about women in community. 
women in community are so easy to gather. Like, come on, how, how many times am I the only one? You are in a store and you trying on something and nobody's there with you. You'll ask whoever, how does this look? <laughs> you don't even know them. But you just need some confirmation. You know, people in the store FaceTiming people. Hey, how does this look? Because we, need, we, we gather, we love to gather. But here's what I want us to realize. There's a benefit to gathering when we're going through. This story just blows my mind. This is a story of a man named Jephthah. Jephthah was a mighty man of, of valor, but his mom was a prostitute. So his, 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 his dad's family rejected him. Because he's like, you ain't really one of us. And so Jephthah was a mighty warrior. And so Jephthah went out and he was asking God to help him gain victory. And if he did, he said, if you help me gain this victory, the first thing that come out of my house when I go home, I will sacrifice to you. And so when he goes home, something happened. He didn't recognize. He thought maybe an animal was going to come out. But what came out was his daughter. And so in Jephthah, I mean, I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 11, verse 34, when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Say only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. This is it. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. I said I was going to sacrifice the very first thing that came out, but I didn't think it would be you. Now look at her response in verse 36. She said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. She was raised right. She said, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. They did, God did what you asked him to do. That's why you need to be careful making these vows to God. God, you blessed me with the lottery. I'm going to bypass the McGilla church. You, you, you know what? Pastor be like, they don't, I don't even know what happened to them. They changed their number, everything. But we make these vows. God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'm going to get back in your church. Come on. I, I, I know I used to do that all the time. Bargaining, trying to bargain with God. Like I really can order my steps. This him got to order my steps. He says, but you got to, she said, you have to do it. She said in verse number 37, she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. I know I have to do this thing, but give me some time to hang with my girls. Let me spend some time. Let's just, let's go talk. Because what, was ha what had to happen was she was going to become in the service of the Lord. She would never have a husband. She would never have children. Jephthah would never have grandchildren. She now goes into the service of the Lord like a nun or a monastery, uh, in, uh, a monk. So her life, what they had dreamed of, would no longer be. So now she's like every young woman dreams of being married. She had dreams of being married. She had dreams of giving grandchildren to her father. There were dreams that she had, but she said, before I do this thing, let me just go hang with my girls. Because we're going to go and just spend time talking about what could be. They're going to build me up in a way that when I step back here, I can go in with my head held high. See, she didn't wait till after to go. She said, before I go, I need somebody to strengthen me along the journey so that I can come back and fulfill this thing. But what we do when we're going through, I'll tell them later. She spent time. I got a picture this week. It just made me so happy. Markeisha, who sang praise, praise the Lord. A few weeks ago, she had her baby. That's Markeisha and that's Avery. Both of these are members of Antioch. 
Markeisha needed a doula. Avery is a doula. What Markeisha told me, she told me she's going to be watching. Hey, Markeisha. I asked for permission to show this picture. She said, Avery's presence made it so easy for me to give birth. Immediately, I got goosebumps because I said, Lord, that is my heart for women's ministry, that we are in the thick of it with you, that she is giving birth, and yet she could rely on one of her sisters in this church who could come alongside overnight, spend time with her, help her go through it, follow up with her after, be there so that she could bring forth a healthy child. See, Markeisha would have been robbed if she did not understand strength in community. Now, I grew up totally different. I grew up, you don't tell nobody your business, not even family. So much so that my grandmother, who lived with us um, my whole life growing up, she passed away when I was in college. And after she passed away, we found out she had a lot of things. My dad was so hurt. He was her only son. She had a lot of things that she was struggling with that he didn't know about. Things that worried her. Things that caused stress to come upon her. Things that accelerated, I believe, the stress on her heart that caused her to have a heart attack. And my dad kept saying, I just wish she would have told me. She had all these little bills and things like this. You know how they have these little bills. And she had these things, and these people were, were trying to uh, 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 intimidate her and things like that. And so we believe that a lot of her stress was coming from something that could have helped her had she just told somebody. But yet, we want to be so independent, so prideful, so secretive, and our secrets are killing us. See, when we know, we can support. But if we don't know, why, why Jesus got to speak to me in a parable about you? People say, well, pastor, pastor ought to know. He talked to God. Why does Jesus have to interrupt pastor's time when you can just come and tell him? Like, why we got to play these games? And then when pastor don't do it, you say, well, I guess pastor didn't hear from God. No, it wasn't about that. This is the fact you didn't open up your mouth. Or anybody in your circle, not just pastor. There ought to be people in your circle that you can talk to because here's your third and final point. There is healing power when sharing your story. It's healing power. I got it from Scripture, James 5, 16. Confess your sins or faults to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You know why? Things brought to the light can be exposed and healed. Things caught in the dark remain scary. Anybody, when you were younger, you would see things in the kitchen. You would see things in your room. It looked scary. And when mom turned on the light, you'd be like, oh, that's just the teddy bear. So the light brought into something that you didn't recognize was not meant to harm you. See, when you're holding on to your secrets and you're not telling your story, the enemy is blowing up everything. You're the only one. You're not going to have this. You're not going to do this. And so we find ourselves not being able to be free because we're being too quiet about what we're going through. See, thank God for Ginger. Ginger has shared her breast cancer story for a long time. And because she shared her breast cancer, sur uh, breast cancer story, she has helped other people. What if she would have kept her mouth closed? Other people would have been robbed. That's the other part of it. When you tell your story, you empower other people to know that they can also. Because if the God did it for her, he can do it for you. And when we declare that, we bring hope to people. I want, to, I want you to hear me when I say this. Be authentic with all. Be transparent with some. Because everybody can't handle your see-through. But I'm going to be me with everybody. That's what I mean by being authentic. Be authentic with all. Be transparent with some. Your transparency needs to be revealed in a safe place, in a place of wisdom, 
in a place of encouragement, a place that follows the word of God, not a place of gossip. So can I just say one more thing about it? I'm going to say it anyhow. Keep your transparency off Facebook. They don't mean you well. Them little, I'm praying for you, comments, they don't mean it. They just want to follow the post to see what happens next. When you really going through, you need to find a safe place. Jephthah's daughter found a safe place. She took her girls with her, the people that have been tried and true, people who can see me at my worst and not expose me to other people, people who know all my flaws and allow me to still be me. Don't kick me to the curve. See, there's healing power when you share your story. I want to close with this um, example. There is something that happens when we tell our story. We release the stress that's attached to the trauma. All of us, we got stuff that's buried down deep on the inside of us. And see, stressful situations can impact the body and the brain. And you've heard it like flight, fight, flight, or freeze, right? Let me talk about that real quick. So I'm going to use an, an example of a lion and a gazelle. If a lion is chasing a gazelle, the chase is the flight. The gazelle is running from the lion. And then there's a struggle, which is the fight. That's when the lion grabs the gazelle. But then there's something that happens if the lion just happens to let his mouth loose and the gazelle runs, the gazelle will run back to the herd and start back playing with the other gazelles. Because there is something that we need to release. When we're stressed, when we're holding on to stuff, we hold it in our bodies. And what the gazelle does, when it finally gets loose, it shakes it off. But what happens with us, we press it down. We don't release it. So we're walking around with all this cortisol in our bodies. Am I right, Kashawn? Is that what it is? We, I, I studied. We, we walk around with all this cortisol in our bodies, and we say we good. But our story is not being told accurately because we're hiding the very thing that we need to release so that we can be free. So we come to church Sunday in and Sunday out, they ain't talking to me. I don't know who they talking about. I ain't telling nobody my business. We don't even confess to the Lord. But we're not able to bear fruit in our lives because we ain't shaking it off. So our bodies remain in a perpetual state of fight or flight. There's no release. So we can be 50 years with the same trauma and no releasing. That's why healing is so important. Because the healing comes in the release. It doesn't come in the just getting up, moving on. I know I'm, I'm checking somebody because you have felt like I'm good. I've dealt with it. But yet every time a wind blows by your heart concerning that area, defensiveness rises up. Fight rises up. Moving on to another place rises up. So you leave this church and go to another church because somebody got close to you and you don't want nobody to get close to you, so you want to go somewhere else so you can hide. No, I'm going to a, a church of 5,000 people so that they won't see me. Nobody will know me. Can I tell you you can't hide from the Lord? So we got to learn how to shake it off. We got to learn how to move forward. So life is going to come with stuff. The question I want to ask you, how are you going to handle your stuff? When you decide you're going to handle your stuff by remembering these three things. Number one, what God has for you is for you, and it's all good. Number two, there is strength in community. Number three, there is healing power when sharing your story. Then we can continue to move through life with peace and hope as God orders our steps. Come on, let's give God a praise for the word.